Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns, and this is episode 358. And this is the show where we share cutting edge strategies on acquiring leads and sales for your business through paid traffic. And today we're going to be talking about a paid traffic source we've never, ever talked about here on Perpetual Traffic. Kazem Aslam, the co-host here of Perpetual Traffic. How are you, buddy? I'm living the dream, Ralph. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. We're uh, we're in similar climates. You're in 80 degrees and sunny, and I'm in 17 degrees and cloudy here in the, the great state of Massachusetts. So it's, uh, I, I don't know. Who's to say who's smarter? <laughs> who, who's to say who made better life decisions? Well, I like it cold, actually. I really do. <laughs> do you really? Yeah. yeah do, oh, man. Yeah. That's like a check mark on this, are you a serial killer list? <laughs> That's nuts. I hate when it's too hot, actually. So... And our guest today is sort of in an area where it's usually like burning hot, but actually now it's kind of cold for him. So he's waiting patiently in our green room here. But uh, yeah, so that's that's our, our MO. Like we've always been up in the Northeast and I don't think I'll ever really change that whole cold thing because no. 100 degrees, even if it's a dry heat like it is in Arizona, it's still disgusting. No, I'm a desert rat, man. I, I love the heat. I crave it. I, I, I do ice baths to torture myself intentionally. Like that's the, the most extreme pain I can think of. Mm. So I, I won't, I won't ever be joining you. I do like the Pacific Northwest though. I like rainy, so I can do that. Mm. Like my wife and I were, we were splitting our time between Phoenix and Seattle before COVID. Well, now it's snowy up there. So, you know, with global warming, everything's all screwed up. So God right. knows, it, you know, you never know. It'll start snowing maybe in Phoenix and then you know, maybe it's like going to be 70 degrees and, and sunny move. here in February. Who the hell knows? So, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a new thing for us. Well, here we are in 2022, and uh, we want to uh, continue our promise of reading out loud our positive reviews over from iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure that you do leave us a positive review. If you do, we will make you perpetual traffic famous for at least 10 to 15 seconds. And it seems like... We uh, we got a couple just recently, and then one from way back that we missed. So I think we we have to talk about that one, or at least explain it. It's not quite as good as some of the ones that are most recent, claiming that Cosmo oh, is a genius, this is my favorite of all yeah, time, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we're, we're kind of over that now. So uh, I don't like the way you said claiming there, Ralph. <laughs> I think it's stating. I think it's just stating the truth. <laughs> Well, according to them, it is, you know, it's like yeah. it's their own truth in their own head. So what do we got this week as far as positive reviews go? This is my favorite review of all time. So uh, Principessa Lauren, also a great name. Uh, well done to you. Pat on your back. I think this is the funniest one we've read. And Lauren says, this podcast is both the slow burn of how to grow your campaigns, but more importantly, how to lay a foundation for the successful climax to your bottom line. Now, I didn't read the title, so you don't know why this is so funny. <laughs> the title of the review is The Trashy Romance Novel Equivalent for Tactical Digital Marketing Knowledge. And that's why I, and I, I should have I started this in the wrong direction. I've screwed this all up. But the foundation for the successful climax to your bottom line, it's like a trashy romance because you just can't put it down. Ralph takes the theoretical and proven strategies down to digestible bites for actionable items small business owners need. Casa Muslim deconstructs his agency's complex. And then I, it looks like she missed a character count thing because it trails off. But I'm sure she's going to say and is an absolute genius in his own yeah, right. I'm sure that was how she was going to end that. That's so how it was going to end. I can feel novel. that. So that's good. That's uh, a yeah. yeah, we're definitely going to get an explicit rating for this show here, even if we don't say like F-bombs or four letter words. But that was pretty good. No. Well, we're like the Fifty Shades of Grey of podcasts, apparently. <laughs> well, well, apparently. Um, Is that a trashy romance novel? I don't know. Well, let's get past the self-congratulatory part here and actually get to something that is of a little bit more substance. Uh, and I think our listeners might actually want to hear about this a little bit more. But uh, we, uh, of course, if you do you know, get, leave us a positive review. We will say it here on Perpetual Traffic. Uh, but today's conversation is the really meat and potatoes of this week's show. It's not all about Kasim and his genius. Uh, today is uh, <laughs> is Dan Larkman. He is the CEO and founder of Keens Digital. And we are going to be talking some new acronyms I don't think we've ever really talked about here on the show before, like OTT connected tv programmatic stuff like that i mean 
kind of crazy. Um, so I know you're going to be enjoying that. Uh, and we're going to get into that and what you, the perpetual traffic listener, uh, can grab for your own on that side of the advertising world. Cause we've never talked about it here. All right. So here we are back with Dan Larkman. Welcome to perpetual traffic, Dan. Hey, thanks. Thanks Ralph and Kazan for having me. I didn't, I didn't realize that we were about to join the 50 shades of gray digital podcast. So, um, yeah. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> now you're like, this is an incredible mistake. Yeah. Who signed uh, me up for this? How am I going to basefully, like gracefully bow out in under 20 <laughs> minutes or so? Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's what we're now known as apparently. But today we're going to be talking about some really risque advertising that people have never heard about here. And I don't even know if it's risque. It just seemed like sort of a logical sequence from a romance novel. But the point is, is you do some pretty incredible things with advertising that I don't know as if the listener here even realizes they're seeing it when they see it. And we talked about this during the pre-record. I was on my Roku TV last night. I'm like, was that your stuff? Or was that the stuff from ESPN2 or the local cable? Like, how does it all fit in? So tell us a little bit about what you do over at Keens Digital as the CEO and founder over there and what you guys are all about. Yeah, of course. So we, we really focus heavily on connected TV. Um, and so, you know, connected TV is defined differently by many companies. And I think it's important to firstly establish what that is. So for us, Connect TV or OTT, so over-the-top television, Connect TV, when we think about that, we're thinking about the content and the audience that we're running against, right? So exactly, Ralph, like you just said, you're watching TV and you're getting an ad that's perfect for you. Is that because you skew really well on the TV network or because you fall into an audience that can be targeted via any digital channel, just like, uh, just like social, just like search? And so when we think about Connect TV, how we talk about it and we describe it is TV commercials that are that you would see, you know, through any Wi-Fi connection. So if you're watching Hulu, then you're going to be seeing an ad in the middle of Handmaid's Tale. Then that for us is connected TV. And the reason I really highlight that is Connect TV technically is the device you're running on. So it's the TV screen. So YouTube will talk about their Connect TV offering, which will be a short clip. And about 30% of YouTube right now is, is TV screen. So they'll talk about their Connect TV offering. That's very different. So seeing a, a, an ad that you can skip before a cat video is very different to seeing an ad in the middle of Handmaid's Tale, a normal TV commercial. Um, and so they're not considered equal. So um, for us, device, uh, but also when we talk about OTT, it's any content, again, TV quality content that's through a Wi-Fi or a an internet connection. I have a question. So I'm going to dummy this down, Dan, because I, I don't I don't have a good background in connected TV. It's targetable television. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you can target and now walk me through from an advertising perspective, what are the targets that are available and accessible to me? Like how granular can you get? I mean, how granular can you can you dream up? I guess. I mean, I think about. Well, I mean, I remember like Facebook ads. I used to be able to go get like a one-legged blonde nun in Idaho that watches, you know, Handmaid's Tale, and and now they've pulled back on some of that because of privacy concerns. But mm -hmm. can Connect TV be that that specific? It could be. I mean, I think it'd be hard to find a one le one-legged blonde nun watching Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> but if we could, we technically could find them. Um, Huge I mean, demographic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure which audience provider I go to for that one. I'd have to I'd have to RFP a lot. Um, but it, you, you want to be thinking similar to what Facebook, so connect TV. And again, when we talk programmatic and we'll, we'll chat through that is there's many branches off of it right now. So you could buy connected TV. So TV through a Wi-Fi connection directly from, um, ESPN, right. And you're buying a spot just like you would with linear TV where you're working off, you know, uh, TV ratings. Then you pull it back to more of a uh, programmatic play where it's audience first approach. And so our, our approach is to find you as the user or, you know, whatever subset. So for us, it, you can go very, very specific, just like you could with display ads programmatically, Facebook ads. You can do the same thing with TV ads. 
Um, it skews a little different. You know, if you look at Facebook, majority of Facebook's mobile, the majority of OTT is TV screens, right? So you see a different in device makeup, uh, but being able to find people, the audiences are you know, exactly the same type of audiences you could, you could go after. So connected TV is segmentable television mm -hmm. that I can position ads on mm -hmm. and programmatic is the the paradigm that states I'm targeting the user, not the, the media type. Yes. Yeah. For, for me, how I think about programmatic is um, I think about programmatic is the, you know, like eBay, if you will, where you're bidding on a, you're bidding on a product and in, in the, in our sense, it's on a user and an ad placement and you're bidding against everyone else. And the value of programmatic, especially for connect TV and why I believe it's growing so much that specific sector is traditionally a TV placement is going to be you know, a Nike, someone like that, who can afford to put a few million dollars up front at the beginning of the year to buy their ad spots. With programmatic, you could get a Nike, an Allstate ad, uh, a Toyota ad, and then you get an ad from a company that's doing $5 million in revenue right between all those, like sandwiched in. And programmatic allows you to do that because UCASM might be really valuable for you know a d2c t-shirt brand you're not in market for a, a car you're not in market for new insurance right you're still going to get those ads because you know i all state decides to serve a thousand ads to me every day even though I, you know, i've got them as an insurance carrier um but that t that t-shirt brand you may have visited that site it might be connected tv retargeting you may have you know, shown interest in other brands and able to serve you that ad. It builds that brand equity and builds, builds that. So that's what programmatic does. It allows you to be able to bid at, with any, any of the players in the market. You mentioned costs. Here's an impossible question to answer. And I hate this question myself. I, you know, somebody says, how much should I spend on Google ads? I roll my eyes because it's like, well, how big is your market? What's your business for you and who are your competitors, et cetera. But, but I do have something of a from the hip you know, all things being equal response. What do you have to spend in connected TV in order to begin seeing results? How I look at it is we want to look at things like what is the goal that you're setting against it? So with traditional TV, it's very branding, right? I know there is DR TV, uh, but it's, you know, uh, trigger points. You know, you see you served an ad at noon, between noon and five past, you saw X type of growth, you know, that type of stuff. Um, when we're thinking about, uh, Connect TV for real performance. The sweet spot we find is anywhere from 35 to 50% of the marketing budget going to some type of mid to upper funnel channel, right? That tends to be where the sweet spot is. You need to fill that funnel, right? Um, but for us, we set the bare minimum at Keens at $10,000. Most of the players are much uh, considerably higher than that, but that should give us enough data to tell you whether it's going to be successful to what goals you have set. Um, but when you're really running, the sweet spot's about 35%, about 35 you're gonna see some real strong returns from an overall marketing rather than channel to channel. Well, dude, the fact that you gave me an answer, number one, like hats off to you, because most people I don't think would have. I love that. And what's interesting is that's our, that's our YouTube minimum too. If we're gonna run YouTube ads for somebody, we need about 10 grand because in, just in order to, to reach the amount, you know, with YouTube, you're paying for views paying for clips, but optimizing off of views. So it's kind of like this one, two punch thing. And if you don't reach market penetration, you're not going to get anywhere. And I can see connected TV functioning the same way. It's also performance, right? You know, when you, when you're thinking about, um, let's, let's compare it to display ads, display ads are what, well, yeah, let's call it three to $5 CPMs, right? I know they they skew a little bit, but just as an average, you talk about social, it's about $8 CPMs around that type of range. We talking connected TV, you're talking 30 to $45 CPMs. Right. So you want to have served enough ads to actually start seeing whether this will work. Like I, I, I remember back in the day when I worked at an ad network and um, you're selling display ads. And basically you'd have someone who'd start a campaign and pause it a week in because they didn't see the performance. And it's like, well, you've, we've warmed up the engine, but we've not really got anywhere. So it's like you're just spending money everywhere to test, but you're not actually giving it time to see if it works. Yeah, for Connect TV, if you spend less than ten thousand, you're really not going to see what the true outcome will be, uh, and that is a bare minimum. That's really a stepping stepping stone. So, specifically, so mm -hmm. we were talking about this um, maybe before we hit record. Is I was watching ESPN two last night, 
at, through my Roku TV and I saw, you know, the State Farm ad. Then I saw, I don't know, like a Geico ad. And then I saw like these demographics. Then I saw, I think it was, it was a stock trader thing. And then something about, you know, gift giving that was really I forget exactly who it was, a touch of modern or something like that. I was really like dialed into like my demographic. And I was thinking to myself, like which one of those was programmatic or were they all programmatic because it was through a, you know, Roku is basically is free. And then you get ESPN two on that. Um, I mean, you have to pay for the, you know, the TV and everything else. But I mean, the point was like, it's basically, it's right there. So how do, actually, no, it was through Fubo TV on Roku. So I was paying for that, but then I was getting served the ad through ESPN too. Like take us through that sort of lineage. I don't know if I'm necessarily explaining the question all that right, but it's like who owns what in that supply chain? Uh, so or everyone, is it hard uh, for you to say? <laughs> it's hard to say exactly that specific ad, but what you can say is that ESPN owns some of the ad placements. Um, uh, Roku and own some of the ad placements, right? And so, and so what you're doing is you're kind of sharing them out with who the actual seller of that is at that point in time. Um, and so <clears throat> you, what you'll start seeing is some of those ads will be, you know, ESPN have a sales force themselves, right? They're going out doing all those upfronts, which you're probably seeing most of the insurance companies are those upfronts with them, right? Fix CPMs, you know, GRP type model. Whereas, Huge buys, exactly. multi-channel, got it. And the more specific targeted ones are more likely through Roku or, or, or any of their you know, third parties who are selling on their behalf. You, you tend to find that, <clears throat> but you will also see, you know, because again, if you're watching ESPN too, and the show you're watching is you fall into that audience perfectly, it could still be, you know, a, an upfront buy, or it could not be programmatic, right? It could just be, you know, almost a guaranteed buy within that. So there's so many different steps within it, which I think is what making it most interesting is it's hard to tell whether that ad was targeted to you perfectly because you've got an audience that says you fall into said audience or because the TV network just hit you perfectly. Right, right. So when I sold like, my first job, my second job actually out of college was selling cable advertising, local cable advertising. And so we had top of the hour was national. And then I think it was 12 past was regional. 22 past was local bottom of the hour was like public service announcements. And then maybe another national, it was cut up like that. So we would only sell, like I was selling to, you know, car dealerships, oriental rug shop owners, stuff like that. And we had that third spot at like 22 past the hour. And I always knew, cause all of a sudden the, the ad quality was like, Oh, it was a great, like, you know, Budweiser ad at 12 fast. And then you see my ads at 22 fast. I'm like, oh my God, there's the guy out front. We're having a sale going out of business this week only. Cossum's Oriental Rugs. No, or whatever the guy's yeah, name I, I was. Knew, I knew we were I going, knew we were going down that road. Right. See, I can do that. You know, we've, now we know each other. But anyway, the point is, is like that, like, it was really that cut up. But we were very, very, we knew exactly what we could sell. And how, how we could sell it. We're selling these ad blocks. They're like, yeah, you know, it's 10, I think it was $10,000 minimum back then too. <laughs> Even back then, back Maybe in we need to up our minimums. We were selling in 1920. <laughs> this was. Yeah. But adjusted for inflation, Dan, that's like $14 million. <laughs> yeah. $19 million. <laughs> and because so, it's now in color, you've got to, you've got to increase that too. <laughs> well, you had to have the rabbit ears just so, and like the antenna on the roof and everything else that goes along with it. I am the only guy here with gray in his beard. I, I hate all you guys. But anyway. I got a little. Yeah, I am, sure. Yeah. So anyway, but it was really, really specific. Like you knew exactly what was where. But now it's just you're bidding on programmatic. You have no idea. You're bidding on that user and wherever that shows up, whether it's through Roco, whether it's through whether it's through Fubo.tv, like wherever it shows up, it doesn't really matter as long as you're chasing that user. Yes, but it's also in a different world because you know you're thinking now VOD and video on demand is so such a crucial part of you know digital television, right? So you know when you think about you know I, I think I think back in the day when I was in the UK, 
my family were really big into Friends. I probably shouldn't admit that out loud. Really big into Friends. And every Friday okay. night, a new Friends show. show came Hassan out. doesn't know what show that is, by the way, because he's too young. No, my wife's obsessed with Friends. My wife would win a Friends trivia contest against writers of the Friends. <laughs> so I'm, I'm with you. I love her. And, and so every Friday night when that came on, everyone was home to watch it. Whereas now when you think about you know, any, any release on Hulu, right, it comes out weekly. You don't know when it comes out. I get a notification on my phone that a new, a new show, you know, a new, a new one of them came out or something. You have no idea when it came out. You're not sitting around waiting. It's VOD. And so instead of the model where you're talking, which is the show comes out at this time, the ad break is going to be this time, the ad is going to show within it. You're not get seeing that because you, a lot of it, there is still live TV, but a lot of it's video on demand. And so you're watching at any point when you want to watch it, which means the tracking becomes much harder. Right, because as opposed to knowing that I served an ad at ten twenty two, and for this brand, and then you can track what happens because everyone saw it at the same time. You either saw it, or you didn't. Now it's like, well, I might have served three ads at ten twenty two, three ads at ten, you know, uh, ten twenty two and ten seconds, and you just you're going through right, and so you're actually able to track the individual user, which changes that whole dynamic. Dan, I've got a question as far as targeting. I understand I understand targeting on a smartphone and a tablet because those are individually held devices relatively consistently. But a TV belongs to pretty much everybody in the house, right? So you have, you know, toddlers up to the, the geriatric crew, uh, depending on the household. How is it that connected TV can target when you're dealing with that type of, of amalgamated demo and, and psychographic profile? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's different ways that different companies would do this and tackle this. Um, for us, we talk about cross device partners. So, you know, the live ramps of the world, the oracles of the world, ad brains, tap ads, those type of people. And the reason we partner with them is so we can start tracking from different devices that, that, that users associated with. And really it's about tracking the user. It's about tracking shows. It's about tracking, um, and using things. IP address is one of those variables that is able to tell us the, 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 the household. And what becomes interesting is depending on the brand is depending on which device skews a little, uh, gets more of the ads. Um, and so a great example, when, you know, you talk about, you know, family with, with kids at home, if you're serving an ad that's, let's say it's, uh, you know, female supplements, you probably want that to be more of a one-to-one -one relationship. And therefore, serving less on the TV screen where it might be in, you know, uh, kids watching the TV and more on the, you know, phone, tablet, um, desktop. And if you're serving something like, I know, Bose headphones, you probably want that to be more on the TV because you're okay with anyone in the house seeing it. You know who we know who we're targeting because we're using those cross device companies um, to be able to find those users. So, what we're using, you know, in essence, is whatever your browsing behavior is. And your typical browsing behavior is on your phone, your 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 desktop. We take that information, pass that on to, or we use our you know audience providers, pass those on to those cross device companies that tell us that TV that's associated with you. And it could be other people watching it at the same time, and that's okay. Um, and then we're able to then target you on that TV screen. Um, and then really, what we're looking at is the end result of that. So it's easy to find people but then the question is well how do i know that you didn't serve an ad on my tv while my kids are watching it and i'm actually in the office working All right then we need to look at what was the end outcome of that 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 ad how much did it cost to drive you Cassim, to the site and that's the variable that then starts playing playing into it is how what time of day are you likely to be watching it rather than your kids Right. Is there a specific How do you time? connect those dots? Like if I see an ad on the television and I visit the website from my phone, are you able to, to you know, mm -hmm. IP address triangulate and say, oh, that was those two things? Were yeah. So we we lean a little less on just the IP address. Uh, and the reason for that is there's a number of companies um, in our space that will use IP address predominantly. The problem that we have is like you look at like the MRC, uh, the Media Rating Council, and you look at um, you know, other you know, independent bodies all deem IP address as, as too inaccurate or at best household extension. And so for us, it's like what we want to do is make sure we're using and we're checking our own, you know, we're getting other people to check our homework rather than checking our own homework. So that's why we partner with, you know, the live ramps, the Oracle, the ad brains, the tap ads of the world. So when we serve an ad on a TV screen, 
the device ID, other type of variables get passed onto those cross device companies that tell us the other devices associated with that same user. Mm. I'm not going to use the word fingerprinting because I know that that's a, that's a bad word in the, in the realm of trend, but it sounds like it uses some of those same kind of methodologies in order to, to you, you, you get 50 data points. And that gives you the, the opportunity to kind of put all those together and say, okay, 35 out of 50 match. This is probably the same. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, without going too deep into it, it's, it's a probabilistic graph, right? It's a, it's a, you're, 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 you're trying to get as close to that line as possible. And we have to have, you know, from, uh, you know, those companies boast that it's at least 95% accurate. So you have to be above 95% of their confidence rating before they'll count the other devices, um, which is why we part, which is why we partner with them. Because it's a case of, if you're using an IP address, the confidence rating is a question mark next to it, right? You well, they're about to kill IP. Didn't Apple just come out and say, we're not going to deliver IP address anymore and a bunch of browsers are doing the same thing. So it's, it's not reliable anyway. And it's gonna well, you've also, got, um, you've also got TV networks that have been masking the IP addresses. And, you know, that's been known where you might get 50 IP addresses, which is one per state. Right. You know, like if you're using that as the success metric, you're not you're not able to see what's outside of that. And when you look at someone like a live ramp, they start with the household. So they start with your physical address and then work their way up rather than starting with IP address and working your way down. And so that's how you can get that level of confidence, which is why we have that level of confidence. But basically from there, I'm then able to track you on your phone, on your whichever device you're using. So when you go to that site, I'm able to say that I know I served you a TV ad and I know that within the window that we agreed, you came to the site. Therefore, to drive someone there, it cost $1.50, $2, your cost per visit to the site. And then I can track you and say, what did you do? Did you make a purchase? Did you become a, a lead? Uh, or did you just leave the site? I went to track all those variables, which I think is where you get, you know, kind of where, you know, the the... the where this all comes together when you think about attribution is you know what happens to you as the individual when you see the ad and where you go and so you could track it then you're tracking it very similar to how you would track facebook how you would track display programmatic how you, you know any other channel because you can track that individual user geographic tracking can i say just the state of arizona just this zip code just this region exactly yep you go down to zip code level dude that's so exciting to me especially given kind of where we are right now, we're, we're, we're starved a little bit for top of the funnel traffic at mm -hmm. the moment, or at least targetable top, top of the funnel traffic. This is a really good opportunity for a supplement. Mm -hmm. I, I would say this, I've worked in, you know, I've worked at companies that just did display retargeting. I've worked at the, you know, the ad networks of the world. I've worked at a social company that predominantly all of those. Um, and again, a data, I'm a data person. I'm a data geek. I, you know, the team always joke that if I put anything together, it's always an Excel for them, even if it shouldn't be. Um, so, and I'll tell you from data, the one, ch the channel that I buy into most is connected TV. And that's, you know, I, I, I know I'm here as the CEO of Keens, that's connected TV to anyone, right? For me, if you're serving someone a 30 second ad on their TV screen, what we're seeing through the data is people are visiting the site at a really high rate, really confident rate. Uh, and then the activity they're doing on site is increased because, you know, if I'm looking for headphones and I Google headphones, I'm going to get a list of different headphone providers, right? Whereas if I've seen an ad for Bose and I know the exact headphones I want, I can go online, Google Bose, come straight through. And then you're starting to see that now when I'm on the site, I know why I'm there. The exploration of that brand happened during the TV ad. Well, so what's, what's funny, I've only got one client that runs connected TV and that probably speaks to the size of the clients that I have. Um, but we run heavy, heavy, heavy attribution modeling and tracking uh, using a software called North Beam. The connected TV client has some of the highest brand searches of any client we've ever seen on a, on a percentage basis. So to the point that Ralph just made, we protect their brand heavily and they have some competitors out there trying to poach. But we can see a direct correlation between connected TV ads and the number of, of branded searches coming in, both for their branded brand and then also for the products that are being pushed 
through those connected TV ads. I just, to be honest with you, I didn't think it was that accessible. When I asked you about pricing, I thought you were going to say hundred grand. Yep, and that's what most. I thought it was going to be hundred grand a month. That's nuts to me. So I'm going to tell you that the the uh, we're actually about to launch like a little MythBuster season uh, series that we're, we're pushing out. But it's like firstly price. Most people, it's six figures you're expecting. Most people think they don't have video assets. Like we built something on our site that you can drop the video in. It's open source. You know, anyone can use it. You don't have to give us any information. You get to see if that video is actually high enough quality. Because the two biggest barriers you have in Connect TV for smaller brands is I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars on building out video assets. But most small brands in today's world have some killer videos that they're pumping through social or, or they're putting in, they're putting other, they're, you know, YouTube, that type of stuff. Can they be repurposed? And then what's the, what's the, what's the budget? And I think both of those are the reason that people get a little fearful of it. Uh, and then the third thing would be attribution and how you actually track because you know, Google Analytics doesn't track. Um, it tracks anything anymore. It, it really doesn't. <laughs> Tells you absolutely nothing. Yeah. I mean, I joked about it. I think I did yeah, a blog listen. post some point last year and I was like, the, the thing that my prediction was Google Analytics either has to innovate or it's the dinosaur of, of advertising. Like it just doesn't, you know, it works for, for search, right? You know, you get a click, but outside of that, Facebook isn't really appearing that much. You know, yeah, uh, Connect TV, like you can't click on a TV ad. So, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be recording in there. So I think that's so a multi-touch attribution. Customers, like if you were to say, all right, this is ideal for a, for this type of business. I mean, I know you, you all sort of share a, a large, a large brand, a large national publicly traded brand. It's like a big company. So exactly what Cosm just said. And I thought, you know, it's going to be a, ah, at least a hundred, 100k like you're, you're quoting what we used to quote back in the cable days you know a 10k so what what's the ideal customer if you were to say all right i will create a company right now specifically for the stuff that i do inside my agency what would that company look like um <clears throat> it's a tougher one to answer we basically say that anyone between five and 50 million in revenue is kind of a sweet spot Right. You obviously got bigger, which it's, you know, it's, it's still, a, it's still definitely a must. Um, but it's really, where are you at with your business? So if you've, you know, I, I think, and this is from the data, I think that we should be in a position where connect TV should be table stakes when you're starting your marketing plan. Like, I think you need paid search. You know, we all know that's a must. Yeah. You need to have email on there. You probably want some level of display retargeting. Um, and social, and I think Connect TV should be part of that mix. Um, and I think that the hurdle that, or the reason I say that's crucial is when you're thinking about growing a brand, what you're wanting is everything of marketing to increase. So just like Cass and what you talked about, Northbeam, what we want, I don't mind if Keynes takes credit for that conversion or we've driven people there and it takes six weeks to get it. And we have a, you know, a, a seven day window conversion window it takes six weeks. We introduce you to the brand. I don't mind passing that over and search getting that conversion as long as the company's growing. And I think that's the part where we talk about. Well, but to the point that you just made, you have to know your acquisition channels mm -hmm. and I've made this mistake. So I'm, I'm about to lob a grenade, but I'm going to lob it at myself first. I can't tell y'all. And it's, it's shameful actually, if I really go back and think about it before we got good, at digging into the data, we had a horrible habit of turning off campaigns that were probably acquisition channels and we just didn't know it because we were looking to, we were getting way too much credit to lack, last click attribution. And so then, you know, we would tell people, oh, good, turn off Facebook. It's not getting anything. Go turn off, you know, whatever, like your, your, your display, your inbound, your this. And, and then over time, you'd see the campaign atrophy. And what's worse is I was an idiot. I didn't know why. It wasn't until we zoomed out and it was like, oh, Facebook actually brought all the visibility. Google converted it, but but they don't they didn't know about you until Facebook. And I imagine connected TV is the exact same way. So from an attribution tracking standpoint, it's so that my, I, that might stand as my biggest career mistake. And I'm yeah. actually I'm I'm, I'm 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 debating whether or not I have Hector even cut that part out just because I'm so <laughs> like it's such a it was such a misstep. But it's one that I think every every business for sure but i think every paid media agency until you got really good at understanding what attribution was and why it was important like these are acquisition mm -hmm. channels and an acquisition channel isn't going to show you the roi that a 
that a conversion channel is going to show you. But it's, it's, where, mm -hmm. it's where all your customers are going to come mm -hmm. from. It's the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think that's the probably the biggest hurdle that smaller brands tend to have is that they're used to running Facebook and they're used to seeing really strong ROAS or you know return on ad spends. And from there, they're expecting that on everything. And you can get that through Connect TV, right? You can get you can run a Connect TV campaign and see some really great return on ad spends. And we've done that. But if you're still not filling that top of the funnel up, right? If you're wanting to appear and you're you're filling that top of the funnel up. You really need to be looking at different strategies within Connect TV, right? And so you can do lower funnel Connect TV, and it, and it's great and it performs really well. But for us, it's like you want to be somewhere in the middle where you're driving new customer acquisition to the site, um, and it's something that we've focused pretty hard on as well. Is we actually just yeah wrapped up, I say just for a, a few months back, wrapped up a, a, a case study because we're heavily focused and in investing on multi-touch attribution. That's a big focus for us because of this exact reason. People can't see really where, you know, what, what, what touch points drove that conversion because people have so, especially, um, especially smaller brands or junior marketing people are so fixated with ROI, CPAs, return on ad spends, right? They're so fixated on that, that they stop looking at how do I fill that funnel up? And I want to say this, and I apologize to any finance people that listen finance people fixated on the CPA. And when you do that, I had a conversation with a finance person, at a fairly big brand um, just for the holidays. And she was saying, you know, we need to improve our customer acquisition cost. And I, my first thing, she said, would you, what would you do? Would you reduce spend on, on upper funnel channels? My question was a short term. Yes. Right. Cut upper funnel. You're going to make money real fast. But do you care about what happens next year? If you care about next year, then you don't want to slow down. Otherwise, you get a short win, a loss, and then you come back again. You know, it's, it's that type of thing that I think is, is really where it becomes interesting, especially around, you know, upper funnel, mid funnel, mid funnel tactics. See that cyclical model with agencies. You, you'll see customers. This is ubiquitous truth. You see customers that go through a, one agency every year or two, 18 months to two years. And what happens is, is they bring in an agency who cuts a bunch of the top of the funnel stuff, shows wild efficiency, makes them a bunch of money, but then it starts to atrophy. And so then either that agency or the replacement comes in and says, well, no, we need top of the funnel traffic, adds the tofu traffic. It's, you know, feeds the machine, but then when they want to improve efficiency, they cut it off again. And, and so the cycle repeats itself. I used to work at, it's the UK version of Pet Boys. And every year they would have goals. And one year this store was the top store in the company. And the next year it was the bottom. And the next year it was the top. And the next year it was the bottom. I was like, what metric are you guys using that, like, because you're just using your last years the whole time. So you're making yourself look good, then as bad as you can. And then as good as you can, and as bad as you can to try and win every other year. And it's that type of thing that I think is, is you know, the, the basic marketing model um, in a lot of companies. I think it's so common though. I mean, I think, you know, from a programmatic perspective, if I'm selling connected TV, yeah, I mean, you have to, it's almost like you have to have the more mature, higher level, 30,000 foot view thinkers just to even have the mindset to be able to handle the fact that, yeah, you're not going to get your last click attribution off that $10,000 media buy that you buy through me, but it's going to help increase overall business that's that's a big leap without really showing a lot of reporting and attribution i mean is that part of the success of the model is to make sure that i mean you can probably churn in a you know a bunch of people 10k here 10k there whatever and then they come in and eh, didn't work and then they leave who knows why maybe it was creative maybe it was placement maybe it was just like the algorithm just didn't have time to do the work like for longer term success, it's almost like you've got to have that mindset of marketing efficiency ratio as opposed to just last click attribution and ROAS. Is that safe to assume? Yeah, I think confidence is, is I think confidence in the individual is a, is a must, right? Um, and I think, I think the, 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 our industry is, has every company claims they have the best ROAS or the best CPA, right? I think we like the term, you know, CPA or ROAS fatigue has been thrown around a, a lot recently where you look at, you know, you look at one company's reporting and they're the best performing company of all time. You look at another, that's the best performing. And so you need some type of centralized way of looking at it. I think that's what 
that's what people's fear is when it comes to something like a Connect TV or a middle or upper funnel channel is, well, why should I trust Keens or why should I trust anyone else? Right. And so it's a case of what data can you present to people to show them what that multi-touch attribution looks like? Can I show you that when I served someone an ad and they clicked on, um, you know, one, of, one, of, one of Kassam's um, paid search ads, can I track that? Well, we can track it on our end because you know, you're not going to have any awareness that we serve that person the ad. You're just going to see that click on the Google ad. Well, how do I? And what are you doing to do that, Dan? Is that secret sauce, or yeah. is there software you can share with us? Um, it's not really the secret sauce. Is what we've set we've set it up in a way so we can start tracking based on. There's a multi way multi ways that we do it, but it's either the URL, it's some way of tracking within the pixel or the piece of code that we put on the site, so we can track okay. where that. So user it's UTM comes parameters, on. first party data, Ish. cookies. Yep. More or less proprietary to you. So, yes. Yeah. It's it's okay. it's a lot through. We we use the URL a lot for it, right? Um, and it's a little different because you know Google Analytics update means they pull a little bit away from you know, the UTMs. They use like the GCID and stuff. Dude, um, I hate the new geo. <laughs> I hate it with the passion of everything. It's so. It you know what? It it feels like an empty shell. It's like you're looking at something that's going to have new tools bolted into it someday, but they rolled it out too soon. And they probably, they, I, it, there's way smarter people than me working over there, but it feels disembodied. It's, it's, it's definitely kept me up at night a few times trying to work through some of these things. <laughs> so, yeah. so I could say that, but, but using that, you're able to then track and say, well, okay, I know this person clicked, this, case, this person came to the site and we know they came to the site and we serve them an ad. I see that UTM or I see that uh, GCID. I'm able to then track that user and say, here is how many people came through paid search, paid social, paid. I'm able to track that and then pass that back to the advertiser. And it's all in real time for us, but we're able to show you that and say, here's how many people there were. So you can say, you've got two options. You could say, well, I'm going to discount Keynes's attribution by 10% because there was an overlap. Or you're going to say, actually, I'm going to need to spend 8% more on paid search because I'm running out my budget too soon because we're driving more people via search. Right, Keens are driving eight percent more people into the search funnel. You know, for us, that's how we look at it, and then we're able to track that from beginning to end. So we're able to tell you how many of these users converted that went through paid search. How many, you know, and by being able to do that, you're able to then start seeing what that true impact is. Um, and there's other really cool things that we've we've been testing out recently. Things like um, true um, control group or A/B testing through Connect TV. You know, and some of those stats have just come back and have been insane. Yeah, you know, one of them, um, one of the stats that that really sticks in your head was, if someone was exposed to a TV ad, and then a CTV ad, and then clicked on a paid search link, they were four point four times more likely to purchase than if they just clicked on a paid search link. You know, based on the control group. Any any distinction between a paid search and a branded search? No, 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 no. okay, no, we're not, we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, but no, what, I would imagine it would be sold. branded search. <clears throat> uh, I I would. You typically see branded search increase, um, but you t typically see all search increase. And and again, it depends on the brand, right? Again, if you're talking something like Bose, people know who they are. I'm only using Bose because I have a set of headphones right here. Um, uh, and so if you're using them, people know who that is. You're going to Google Bose, right? But if I'm talking about um, uh, yeah, a brand you may not have heard of, uh, there's a brand called Toadfish. Right, it's a great brand. It's basically similar to a competitor to Yeti, uh, but it's really like focused around boating. For them, their ad, or the creative, really should be about the unique selling point of them. And you might not remember who they are, but you might remember, you know, um, non-tippable dog bowls, right? Yeah, and therefore, that's such a great ah, point. Okay. Gotcha. you see what I mean. But it depends on you yeah. as the brand. If you're Bose, you just it's your name. Whereas depends if you're where Toadfish, you are on the awareness curve, really, exactly. Gotcha. Uh, and so that's the real crucial thing for us. So if you only focus on branded, it's great. But if you're focused on branded, your creative should be those, you know, uh, quick loans, you know, like those ads that are like, call us if you need a loan, call us if you need a loan, call us if you need a loan. And they just say the brand name over and over again so many times. It's like, I'd remember it. Um, outside of that, for us, the real DR, as I see it, and the real brand uh, user acquisition comes from the unique selling point as the hero of the ad. What's that point that you makes it? You said DR, then what is DR? Uh, direct response. 
Okay. So direct response or, or user acquisition, either of those, it's what's a unique selling point that makes me interested in your brand more so. And uh, it's actually a big distinction between linear and connect TV. So for linear ads, We've always been kind of taught that you want to start the ad and you build it up to the end of the ad. So, you know, you think about, I don't know if you guys did this as, as kids, but you'd watch a TV ad and you'd, and if you have siblings, you'd be like playing a game of who could guess who the brand was within it, right? Great for a game for children who have little disposable income. Not great from a, a brand point of view wanting to sell, right? Um, whereas in Connect TV, you know, our view is kind of reverse. Get my attention. Assume I'm not paying attention and I've picked my phone up when Hulu ads are on. Get my attention. And you're going to get that with a unique selling point or something that tells me why I should watch the TV. That's the part you care about most. And then make sure they remember the brand. Yeah, maybe a persistent URL or a brand logo or something. But some way that someone might not be searching for Toadfish. They might be searching for koozies or non tippable dog bowls and then they will find toadfish and be like oh yeah that was the brand i was looking for well that means you have to be intelligent about your data too because you know to the point ralph made earlier maybe running connected tv means your brand searching and ctr goes up which is what i would call a cons uh, an assisted conversion but maybe you just have a ctr lift in your general campaign because more and more people are now more receptive to your brand and they're looking for your unique value proposition. And if you're not paying attention to that CTR lift, you don't realize that connected TV is, is the assist. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's why you'd need some of the data points. And that's why, you know, from my point of view, it's about being as transparent with data. I know everyone uses that term, right? But like giving every piece of data possible so you can actually see where that impact is. You know, it, it hurts us if we tell you you have a, you know, we've driven people at a dollar fifty to your site, right? You're like, great. I'm not really seeing the end, the end outcome because I don't see it in GA. So for us, it's like, how do I get you all the information so you can see this is a viable channel, especially people who are just testing it. And when you're talking about the smaller brands that we talked about earlier that focus on GA, those are the people that need to be able to see here is how many users came through paid search. Here's this. Here is the overall lift I've seen to my brand since launching Connect TV. Those are the variables that I think are, are, are crucial. So we have a few questions that we like to ask people at the end of the interviews. And I'm going to dial this into one specifically because we're really talking about something that we haven't, as I said before, discussed here on the show a whole lot. But um, what SaaS product or software product or tool in your business, when we're talking about connected TV, everything that we discussed here so far on the show is your favorite or you find yourself spending a whole lot of time with now relating back to everything that we just discussed or what recommendations would you have for people to either, whether they're into programmatic now or considering doing it, like what would be your, your SaaS product or app of, of choice at this particular moment in time oh that's a great question um it's a hard one to answer and i'll explain why when you think about connect tv it's so new especially programmatic connect tv and it's growing there's like a new company that appears every yeah you know, i can tell you this every two weeks like i'll get someone call me up of yeah we just had a pitch from this person do you know them no you know it's the next company um i don't think there's a great SaaS platform yet in in this market there's a, there's a few that are, are, are making some of those claims. I think that what we what is really crucial is having you know some form of creative. For us, the platforms that are just a must that we partner with, I think the Trade Desk have the is the best DSP for Connect TV when it comes to pipe, the pipes, um, and the cross device so companies. The Trade are Desk, a must. the Trade Desk, yes, and those cross device companies I talked about, you know, the Live Ramp, Ad Brain, Tap Ad, and Oracles. They're a must as well, if you really want to see the actual impact. Um, but there's a few companies from the attribution world, which I really think are going to pick up in 2022. Um, and that's, uh, I know, Cassie, you mentioned them earlier, Northbeam. You know, I think there's a few companies like that. Uh, I know I don't know exactly their impact on Connect TV, um, but I think the multi-touch attribution is going to be a key factor in, in uh, 2022 and, and performance around Connect TV. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Just so I understand the trade desk, this is like if I'm sold on connected TV and I want to run it myself, mm -hmm. I'd go to the trade desk and this is where I can buy that media. So you can buy you can buy the pipes for the media. And this is where I think it makes it a little different. And I'm gonna to have to explain that part, but it makes it a little different to when people are thinking social, right? So the difference being is Trade Desk have set up for connected TV. You can upload the ads, you can you can track, you know, you can do some level of tracking, some level of performance, and yes, you run it yourself. But what you'd still need to do is build up all those relationships with the supply side partners or the TV networks directly. Right. So Trade Desk have some it's, it. it's a lot. And that's what I think people get. You know it I mean? is. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if you remember, you know, uh, when the ad network started moving over to the DSP world, where it's kind of like, you, you can use the pipes, but you still need to go and set up relationships with all these partners to plug it in there. We're kind of at that stage. Um, and there's some huge players, you know, the magnates of the world and you know, the trade desk of those type of people. So there's a lot going on, a lot of moving pieces and consolidation happening. But I, I, it's not just one. You would need to be partnering with all. That's a good first What I hear you start. saying without saying it, Dan, is that's why people would go to Akeem. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah, leads exactly. us to our final question. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where can people find you, Dan? Uh, so you find me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, it's Dan Larkman. Um, or Keynes Digital, K E Y N E S digital.com. You know, both of those have all the information um, about you know, anything to do with Keynes, Connect TV. You know, we've got a lot of resources on our, on our site just about Connect TV in general or tools that can be used for anyone who's thinking about running Connect TV. And again, it doesn't have to be with us. You can go and check if your ad's good enough, high enough quality. We don't ask for any details. You just drop it and then it'll tell you whether it's good enough. Kind of seems in this world, this is like 10, 15 years ago, display networks were everywhere. And now there's Google display networks, which kind of consolidated it all. But there isn't a Google display network yet for what you're talking about, which makes your service smart for you. Pretty valuable right now. Agreed. And you also have some really big players. So think about like in the display world, you have a lot of websites, you know, but then you had the few big ones, the MSNs, the Yahoo's, like, like I remember when Yahoo and MSN were big players. Um, and uh, so you, you had those guys, but now you're talking about, if you want the TV networks, you're trying to convince Hulu to sell more programmatically. So it's, it's the Disney company, you know, which includes ESPN. You're trying to convince all these TV networks that are so used to these upfront buys to then move to the digital platform and then sell it on an open exchange with no guarantees. You're creating all types of fear. So you've got different different um, forces all kind of pulling in a different direction, which is why creating that consolidation, I think will happen. Um, and I think companies like Magnite are doing that where they bought up SpotX, you know, the Rubicon, all, all of that together. I think that's, that's probably where the direction it goes in, but I, I think there's a lot of external forces that are slowing that down a little bit. Mm. So Keen's Digital is definitely your guide to help navigate through that uh, very, you know, crazy jungle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's, it's untamed. You've got the machete <laughs> in hand. That's it. There. Well, absolutely. So head on over to Keens Digital and check out uh, what Dan is doing over there. If this is something that's interesting to you, like I said, this is, this is pretty cool. I would love to have you back on, especially seeing how this industry, I don't know how much consolidation is really going to happen in 2022, mm -hmm. but it certainly is at the, at the early stages and it's really interesting to to hear about how it all fits together definitely you know with attribution and different models and, and ways in which to measure attribution definitely in line with a lot of things we talked about last year in 2021 um but this has been tremendous having you on the show this week and uh i want to thank everybody for listening to perpetual traffic and make sure that you do subscribe and leave a rating wherever you're listening, wherever you listen to your podcast, whether that's Stitcher or Spotify or iTunes or, you know, Google Podcasts. I listened to one of those today. Uh, and make sure you follow me and Kasim over on Twitter. Go back and listen to previous episodes. And, of course, all the resources and show notes for this week's show are over at perpetualtraffic.com. Dan Larkman, thank you so much for coming out and talking programmatic and man, just kind of blowing us away here with your knowledge bombs, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks my for pleasure. coming on Perpetual Traffic this week. And on behalf of my awesome co-host, Qasem Aslam, peace. Until next show, see ya. See ya.